Uh, so no, we're also trying to get our Wednesday night, we're working toward getting our Wednesday night things back up and running with our youth and children, and we definitely need some volunteers for that, uh, and for Sunday school t with the children and the youth. So be mindful, today the message will play into that as we talk about generations uh, and those type things. So uh, we, we need help, and that's an important aspect of our ministry is our youth and children, and generationally, we need to be thinking generationally. I want to take a moment today. I've been moving books this week, and uh, I feel just a prompting to tell you about this book for a minute, because I know sometimes we as grandparents or parents may have prodigals that we're praying for. Anybody relate to that at all, maybe? Uh, and I want you to know that Ruth Bell Graham, this is not a new book, this is an old book, but Ruth Bell Graham wrote this book called Prodigals. Any of y'all heard of Franklin Graham? who runs a ministry you know, under, under Billy Graham's son. Franklin had a season when he was off not following the Lord, and Ruth Graham really stood in the gap for him, and she collected prayers and stories that would encourage her heart to keep praying for Franklin. And, and, and it was just for her. But later, she began to tell people what she had done, and some people encouraged her. Well, would you put those together in a book? And she was kind of hesitant, but then she realized that, man, there's so many people that have prodigals that they're praying for that she then collected her poems and her stories and her prayers, and she made a book. And it's called Prodigals and Those Who Love Them. And if you were to have a prodigal in your family that you're praying for, uh, I highly recommend this book and we were talking about generations today it's so important that we think generationally and we pray for those that might not be in the places where we want them to be we'll let those be our announcements today we're going to join together in our call to worship this call to worship is out of the book of Joel. Uh, it's in Joel chapter uh, 2 and 3. And next week we're going to be looking at these passages of scriptures because we're talking about the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord with the little d. Uh, and so to think about that. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm. The day of the Lord is a day of judgment from the Lord. It is a day of confusion and gloom and disasters. It is a day for repentance and turning to the Lord. For the day of the Lord is great and terrible. Who can endure it? So we repent and turn to God with all our hearts. For He is gracious and merciful, slow and anger, and does not desire to do I love that last phrase because it's not God's desire to do harm at all. He wants for us to repent, to turn to him and, and to know that the day of the Lord can be a day of reward and blessing. There's some different things we're going to look at about the day of the Lord or it can be judgment uh, and feel like that we are moving as a nation more under God's hand of judgment. And we want to be mindful of that spiritually uh, and, and stand together in prayer and repentance ourselves and for our nation. Amen. Joys and concerns. What are our joys and our concerns today? We're here. We're here. Praise God. Yes. Amen. And you know, I do. I'm so appreciative of those who come and attend. Uh, I know many in our church are watching online. And uh, I'm thankful for those that are watching online, too. Uh, but, but I tell you, it sure helps having people here. Uh, there were a couple of weeks I had to go through preaching to an empty sanctuary, you know, because of the, during that March and April time. And boy, that was a real challenge. You know, not in the flow of worship, just getting up to preach the sermon so we could put it online. So I'm always thankful for those. Those uh, that are here, uh, but and then online. Paul. Pray for James Kramer. He just had knee surgery. He's having a rough time of it. And pray. Yes. Uh, so uh, I know him as Jamie, but James. And what, what did you say his name was? Jamie. Jamie. I, I thought you said. And what's his last name? Kramer. Yeah, Jamie Kramer. I was thinking, I thought you said James. I was thinking of Jamie. Jamie had knee surgery. He's one of our CR guys. Very faithful and just awesome guy. But boy, he struggled with his knee. Finally, they, they were praying too. It was, a, it was a tumor, but we don't think it was cancerous. But it was growing and it had to be taken out. So we're praying for him. 
I didn't, I didn't mention CR in our announcement. CR is every Tuesday night and such a powerful time, important time. So be mindful that that will be happening on Tuesday. Keep it in your prayers. Come if you'd like. Um, God's doing good work there through CR. Dean is Dean is doing well. I mean, he just has to take it slow, you know, uh, and it's a three step process for him. He's in the middle of step two. And I appreciate you asking. We miss Jeannie today, especially. So uh, he, he gets out, but just in little spurts. OK, uh, and then we just want to keep him in your prayer. So thank you for asking about him. But we lift up uh, Dean and Jeannie for sure today and we miss them. But we continue to keep them in our prayers, knowing he is making progress. Yes, Lois. Uh, Joy is that the arts and crafts is this weekend. Yesterday was absolutely fabulous. Downtown Blaywater had people everywhere. Yes. And so you have not missed it totally. It's from 10 to 4 today. All right, from 10 to 4 today in the arts and crafts, and boy, it was packed yesterday. It was covered up. So if you're able to make that, it's a blessing. There's a lot, a lot of good things happening at that. Let's take this to the Lord and, and uh, lift, lift these things up. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you are a God that loves us, that you are concerned about our lives and, and that, that what's going on in our lives, and that you are a God who is able to, to work and to move, Father God. We pray for prodigals, uh, those that may have drifted astray, and that your spirit would draw them, and that you would put the right people in their lives to minister to them, to draw them back to you. Uh, Father God, we, we pray for those who are struggling with illness. Some have had surgeries recently. Father God, we pray those who have had loss uh, in their lives in recent days and for your comfort and your peace. Lord, I thank you that you are a healer and that you're a redeemer, a restorer, Father God. Uh, and we, we trust you in those roles in our lives. Lord, we thank you for our community here at Gladewater. We thank you for this uh, arts and crafts and the joy that of how many people responded. Uh, Lord, we pray too for our country in this uh, pandemic. Lord, just for wisdom for each and every one of us. We pray over our our church as we try to kind of move forward opening things up a bit and yet at the same time Lord knowing that we want to be cautious and wise um, but we also don't want to live in fear father as well so lead us by your Holy Spirit uh, day by day moment by moment we do pray for our nation Lord overall we pray that we would be one nation under God indivisible father God with liberty and justice for all guide us by your spirit into that this is our prayer your kingdom kingdom come your will be done lord on earth as it is in heaven hear that prayer lord jesus lord thank you that that you are at work help us to see that lord i pray too for uh, that you would open our ears that we could hear your voice that we would hear the promptings and the leadings and the callings that you have for us in this day lord i lift up debbie as she goes to preach uh today at the danville church and for that church and what you're doing there so uh, lord thank you that you are at work Guide us and lead us by your Holy Spirit. Uh, hear us now, Lord, as we pray, as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand this morning and worship the Lord together. Give Him glory and praise. He is worthy. It's a song of the Redeemer. It's a song of the Every 
this has special meaning for me. It's so very powerful. Uh, when we come to worship the Lord, I think one of the things that we really want to ask Him is that He would speak. It doesn't have to just be through the preacher and the Word. He can speak a million different ways. He can speak. But the key for us is to open our spiritual ears that we can hear. He is present in this place. And He's a speaking God. And as we sing this, let's say it as a prayer. Word of God, speak. And invite Him. And let Him know that we're listening today. Amen.
So blessed to serve him. Uh, so blessed to be in ministry here with you and see God working in, in numerous ways. We're in a sermon series. It's four parts. This is the third week. It's on the day of the Lord. Three of the sermons we're going to be are drawn from the book of Judges because uh, the book of Judges is one of the darkest times in the history of the nation of Israel. And as you look at the book of Judges, there are just some incredible parallels uh, to, to what's happening in the book of Judges to our country today. We looked at first week that said, you know, the downward spiral of sin. And I just feel so much like in our country today, I feel like that there is a, can you check me out? Yeah, there you go. I just feel like so much in our country today that you can see that we're in a downward spiral of sin. Okay, the second week, last week, we looked at the theme of the book of Judges, the last verse, Judges 21, 25, and basically it says, every man did what was right in his own eyes. And you just say, wow, doesn't that describe our country, you know, today? Uh, those might have a little wiggle room, but it's going to be interesting where we go today because there's actual data that supports what I'm going to say today. 
Judges 2.10 is going to be our scripture reading. I want to get that out before us. Judges 2.10. Uh, I'm not going to read from Psalm 78. I'm just going to read from Judges 2.10. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. Another generation arose that didn't know the Lord nor the work which he had done. I'm so thankful for my father. He's a pastor. He's a retired minister. He's 89 years old. He and my mom are going through some stuff right now that's very challenging. My mom is an awesome woman of God. She's an awesome prayer warrior. I'm thankful for her prayers. Uh, my dad's a pastor. I grew up under his teaching and preaching. It was interesting in my late 20s, I was associate pastor at First Methodist Church Pasadena, and I was 15 or 20 minutes from my parents. My dad was the pastor at Clear Lake United Methodist Church. He was the pastor there for 17 years. During the time that he was pastor there, that church went from 1,100 to 3,700 members uh, and had three services, and it was just an amazing thing that God was doing. But in the middle of my dad's busy schedule during that time, we met every Thursday morning, he and I, for uh, devotions. Either he would drive over to our house or I would drive over to his house and we would do devotions and we would alternate doing devotions. But one morning I went over to his house and he began his devotion by looking at me and saying, Bud, do you know what one of the saddest verses in the Bible is? And I thought, and you, you, you know, this is one you're not going to get right, you know, like, like, I don't know. So just kind of to be funny, I said, John eleven thirty five, Jesus wept. Seems like a sad verse to me, you know. Uh, and my dad, he was amused, but he said, but I think one of the saddest verses in the Bible is Judges 2.10, which says there another, another generation arose who didn't know the Lord uh, nor the work which he had done. And, and man, I can, I can just so, you know, relate to that. And we look at that uh, and understand that, okay? I told you about the first week of this. We talked about that we're in a downward spiral of sin. During that time, I also said a very important thing. This is important to remember if you're struck, if you get tempted to do something wrong or you're battling something, is to be strong and battle it because sin carries within itself the seeds of its own self-destruction. And so with addiction or just all kinds of sin, it carries within itself the seeds of its own self-destruction. And that's a part of what makes it a downward spiral. Then the other thing uh, that from last week, you know, every man did what was right in his own eyes. Hey, it's an opinion, you know, that, that we're in a downward spiral of sin, but I think we are. It's an opinion to say that... Uh, it's an opinion to say that a theme of our country is every man doing what's right in his own eyes. But this week I'm saying that there another generation arose that didn't know the Lord nor the things that he had done. And I want to tell you this week I have data to back that up. Okay. How many of you have ever heard of the rise of the nuns? If you've heard of the rise of the nuns, raise your hand. Okay, we talked about this on Thursday, so those are at Bible study. Uh, I'm not talking about Catholic nuns, N-U-N-S, okay? So just, just so you know, I'm not talking about Catholic nuns. The rise of the nuns, there was an article in the Longview newspaper that I actually copied for the Bible study, at least part of it, for the Bible study. It's the rise of the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. N-O-N-E-S, the nuns. Because today they will put out like uh, polls and things like that. And they'll ask, like, are you Catholic? They may just say, are you Protestant? Or they may list out the denominations. Are you Baptist, Methodist, you know, Catholic, Presbyterian? But then it will get down and it will say none. No religious affiliation. And did you know that the fastest growing segment of any of those on the page right now is the nuns? People that have no religious affiliation. Hello, church. Wow. That needs, to, that needs to get our attention. We need to understand that, that more and more we're getting to where, where people have no religious affiliation. And what that means is there's a growing generation of people who do not know the Lord nor the work which He has done. Am I right? 
And we need to feel that in our hearts in the church today. Uh, not that long ago, uh, there was a funeral for a man at our church. And uh, he had a granddaughter at that funeral play uh, somewhere over the rainbow. And we have a baby grand piano at the church, and, and she came in and practiced. And I want you to know that it was awesome. I mean, somewhere over the rainbow, you just like play it again, you know, like just because it was incredible and beautiful. And the thing is, uh, he loved that song, and she could play it well. So many times when they were together, they had a piano even in their house, and he would ask her, you know, whenever she came to play somewhere over the rainbow. And so she played that at his. His funeral and so when the funeral is over and there was a reception you know, in the fellowship hall I went up to her she was probably in her late 20s possibly in her early 30s but I'd probably say late 20s and I said I, I said and there's friends of mine that call me a bull in a china shop okay so you, you may get to know me on some of that sometimes go <laughs> preach on. <laughs> uh, so I went up to her and I say, hey, where do you stand spiritually? I was just curious because boy, you could tell she was just a brilliant young person and how she played the piano and what she was doing in her life. And I said, where are you at spiritually? And, and she almost really did take a step back like that. I would be so bold you know, to ask that. And she said, well, really, I'm an agnostic. And, and, and I'm not really sure, you know, about God. I don't really believe that there is a God. I'm still, you know, trying to figure it out. So really, I'm an agnostic. What category would an agnostic fall in? A nun. A nun. Okay. And, and that is the fastest growing category in our country is, 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 the, is the nuns. People with no religious, you know, affiliation. And there arose another generation that did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done. You know, that really ought to, in my mind, come to us uh, as an affront. You know what I mean? Okay, you read that verse. There arose another generation that didn't know the Lord or the work which he had done. Which generation seems to be at fault in that statement? The older generation, the previous, the older generation. That, that's kind of what we would think, right? I know, like, when I was younger. <laughs> when I was younger, I would always go, that lousy older generation, you know? Like, when my dad read it and I was in my late 20s. That lousy older generation that they didn't teach their kids, you know? And now... Uh, I, I love working with the youth still. I mean, it's just in me. I love working with the youth. Uh, you know, I don't always understand everything they say today, but I love working with them. And, and I say, you know, I know I'm not even the next generation. I'm like granddad, but just know I love you. I care about you and I'm praying for you. So put up with me. Okay. But, but, but like, you know, now like you work with the youth and boy, you know, You know, and, and, you know, they got their video games or, you know, the girls start texting her boyfriend. I'll say, hey, just give me your phone. I'll help you with that text. You know, uh, and, you know, the, 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 you know, the other thing is, like, you know, if I'm teaching, I say, hey, would you not use your phone? Like, you know, while I'm teaching, that would be, that would be good. And so sometimes, you know, they slip and I take the phone and it's really weird because I think they may die because they can't breathe without their phone. <laughs> you know, like you take the phone. <laughs> and, and so, so like now that I'm older, I'm like, you know, this is kind of challenging. And then I will tell you, here's, here's a real thing. I cannot just whip up a can of Jesus and put it on you, Morgan. You know what I mean? You want them to know the Lord, but I just can't whip up a can of it and put it on you. Hey, take this pill and you'll get it. But what we have to learn to do is either create environments ourselves, which I, I love the environment like of our worship today, and I feel like God's presence, and there's a sense that maybe they might feel God's presence. Or I love to take our young people to 
to like conferences or mission trips or different places. Jay was talking this week about how they were at a uh, UM Army and they would have worship at night and that there was a time when they were having worship and they were supposed to have a dance after worship but God became so present at the worship that they didn't even have the dance. I was, at a, I was at a youth camp, leading a youth camp. We had over 100 young people there, and we had a worship that started at 8 o'clock. And, and a part of the worship was, was there were different lines that people could get in for prayer. And, and we had the Debbie line, and that was Debbie and another Debbie. And they were two of the most awesome women, and, and the kids knew that they loved them. We were there at 1 o'clock in the morning with kids still in the Debbie line. Amen. You know, my line got done about 930. <laughs> but the Debbie line, you know, they could go to more than one line. But I was about 12, 15. Like there was one kid over riding. And I'm like, hey, if you're not in the line, you need to go. No, I'm in the Debbie line. He said, but I'm just over here doing, you know, riding and doing something because the lines, rather than standing up in the Debbie line, Debbie, if she stands too long, her feet swell up. And I looked over at her feet and, oh man, you know, but she was just there. Her and Debbie were there with every young person that walked up for all those hours and they gave every young person everything they had. And I will tell you, I know that night through the worship that there were kids that know that God exists. There's numerous ways to encounter God, but worship, prayer, service, ministry are some of the most awesome ways, okay? So like you can create environments or you can take young people into environments where they have a better opportunity. But we have to understand that more and more there's young people that aren't getting put in those environments or not experiencing that. Or they go and have this great encounter and they come back to a church that's dead. God hadn't been there in a while. And they're trying to figure out how does this relate to that? Hello? We have to take it serious that... Our young people today, whether, whether, whatever we mean by young people, I, I, I want us to think generationally, okay? Today, I want you to think generationally. And sometimes people say a generation is every 40 years. But for me in the church, I think we need to look at it different. And I just moved up into that generation because uh, I think generationally, you kind of go 60 and above, generationally 60 and above 40 to 60 as a generation 20 to 40 is a generation and under 20 is a generation I need you to own up today just in your own mind what generation are you in okay okay yeah okay and, and, to, and to own what generation that we're in and to think generationally and, and to realize that we need to be passing the faith at least from one generation to the next. The title of this message is, look on the screen, the title of this message is Passing the Fire of Faith to the Next Generation. One of the things I want to ask you today is, does your faith have enough fire that it deserves to be passed to the next generation? Oh, hello, church. That's one to pray about right there. That's one to take before the Lord. That's not one to answer for yourself one way or the other. That's one that you take into your prayer time and you let God speak to you a bit on that one. Is there enough fire in my faith to pass to the next generation? One of the real powerful books on this is, is one called The Almost Christian. The Almost Christian. John Wesley has an awesome sermon on that, and it's very similar to that, The Almost Christian. And it's talking about youth and young people, and basically it's saying they're almost Christian because that's the faith that they got from their parents. Hello, church. Are you with me today? Is there enough fire in your faith that it deserves to be passed to the next generation? And I will tell you that if we're not passing the faith, then there's not much fire. Because 
some fire in our faith would let us know that we're trying to pray and think about how do I pass this to the next generation because it's so incredibly sad that the fastest growing of the, of the religious categories is the nuns. That's on us. And we need to repent and seek the Lord and, and have Him increase the fire of our faith. Another thing to take before the Lord to pray about is what does it mean to have fire in our faith? Okay, what does it mean to have fire in our faith? I want every one of us to seek the Lord to ask and let God show us. One of the things that I would propose in that, have any of you heard me mention promptings, leadings, and callings? Anybody heard we mention that? Okay, we talk about it in Bible study too to make sure we kind of know what they are. Because I think a sign that you got some fire in your faith is when you still are getting promptings and leadings and callings. Because the promptings and leadings and callings will, de will take you deeper into the things of God. You with me? The promptings and leadings and callings will take you deeper into the things of God. When I talk about promptings, leadings, and callings, word of God speak, that we could hear God speak, that we could know His voice. In John 10, 3 and 4, first, Jesus talking about the shepherd and the doorkeeper, and He's talking about the shepherd. To Him, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear His voice. Do we know we're God's sheep? Not the most flattering, you know, uh, but we're his sheep. And it says the sheep hear his voice. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Did you know I've heard preachers and teachers of the word say that God doesn't speak anymore, that he's given us his word, but that he doesn't speak. That doesn't resound with how my, my faith and how God has led and guided me in my life and I read the word I love John 10 27 Jesus now really speaking about himself very directly says my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me I want you to know today that God has promptings and leadings and callings for every one of us here in this room today. He has promptings, leadings, and callings. The question for us is, are we hearing His voice? Because when we begin to follow those promptings and leadings and callings, it's the thing that helps our faith come alive. It puts the fire in our faith and actually it will begin to draw young people to us to to learn more about that. They don't want to know about dead religion. They don't want to know about going to church if it doesn't mean something in your life. But if church, it means something in your life, if your relationship with God means something in your life, I'll tell you, young people will, will begin to get interested in that. Talking about promptings, I want to go back uh, because I pray for us to get promptings. I was at a church, I was, I was on staff at a church, and I was teaching Sunday school, and one day I was praying about the lessons and the oncoming lessons, and I had a prompting in my heart that I was supposed to invite this one guy to teach a lesson. And it was interesting because there were two twins in my class. And here's what's funny. Roger and the other guy, okay? I can't remember the other guy's name. Roger was real outgoing. He was very personable. Roger had taught the class numerous times. If I was ever going to be gone or something was happening, I would ask Roger to teach. And in the prompting, God told me to invite the other guy. And I'm like, the other guy? Yeah, the other guy. I'm like, I don't even know if he can teach. I'm not sure he talks. I mean, he's really quiet. And then the Lord's like, yeah, I want him to teach in three weeks. And I'm like, but I'm not going to be gone. Like the only time ever Roger teaches is when I'm gone. And so why am I going to ask him to teach if I'm going to be there? Promptings are weird. <laughs> and promptings stir a lot of inner dialogue, okay? So, so, you know, we end this with this guy. So like the other guy. Like I'm, I don't even remember his name. The other guy. Yeah, God's like, yeah. And so in three weeks when like I'm still here, Yeah. So I call the guy and I say, hey, I've been praying and, and I feel like the Lord says that, that, that you're supposed to teach the class in three weeks. Here was his comment straight up. He goes, you know that, that this isn't Roger, right? 
he thought I'd called the wrong guy. And I'm like, yeah, I know. And I know it's strange. But I, and, and he's like, and then he's like, me? And I'm like, yeah. And he says, well, where are you going to be in three weeks? I said, I'm going to be in the class listening to you teach. And it was just silence for a minute. You're going to be there? Yeah. Well, then he goes, what am I supposed to teach on? I'm like, I don't know. I'm just being obedient that you're supposed to teach. He's like, okay. <laughs> so, so in three weeks, I'm curious what's going to happen. You know, this is getting weird, but following God is awesome because it gets weird. <laughs> and a lot of times the weirder it gets, the better it gets. So three weeks, I'm sitting there for this guy to teach, and he teaches on 2 Timothy 2.2. Okay? I want you to know that, that, that if you're around me very much in teaching and preaching, you're going to hear Jeremiah 29.11. Does anybody here know Jeremiah 29.11? If you know Jeremiah 29.11, raise your hand if you know Jeremiah 29.11. Debbie, you know it. Imagine that. Yeah. You should know Jeremiah 29, 11, because it's a great verse to the next generation. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. Young people today need to know that God has a plan for their life. If they know God has a plan for their life, that can make a difference. Because if you know God has a plan, it can help you say no to some things that you know aren't part of God's plan. So young people need to know. So a live verse for me has always been Jeremiah 29, 11, And now I love 29, 11 through 13. And a little heads up, in two weeks, the sermon in two weeks is going to be God has a plan. Any guess what scripture is going to be? <laughs> Jeremiah 29, 11, probably 11 through 13. But I want you to know on the day that the other guy preached, and I'm not kidding with you, I don't remember his name. I'm not like just saying that to make the story. Like I remember Roger, his brother, and this was the twin brother, and I don't remember his name. But the day the other guy preached, God gave me another life verse. Because that day he taught on 2 Timothy 2.2. And in 2 Timothy 2.2, Paul says to Timothy, Paul says to Timothy, take what you have learned from me and teach it to reliable men who will in turn train others. Okay? How many generations are in that verse? Beverly, good job with the mass, four generations. Okay? Common answer is three, but there's four because Paul said to Paul said to Timothy, take what you've learned from me and entrust it to reliable men who will teach others also. Take what Paul to Timothy, take what you've learned to me, teach it to reliable men who will teach others also. I want to tell you one of the one of the bummers of like having pews or seats is we have reduced too many times our discipleship to bring somebody to church to sit under some preacher's preaching or teaching. Hello? And so there's knowledge, there's information, there's Word of God hopefully going forth. The Word of God is powerful. Sharp, you're living and active, sharpen a two-edged sword. There's something good about being where the Word of God is being preached. It's powerful. But I tell you, discipleship is generational and discipleship is life on life. Hello? So one of the things I want you to know today as we, you know, as we close here in 45 minutes is that... Um, <laughs> We, we, we need to think generationally, which generation are you a part of? How are you involved in passing your, hopefully the fire of your faith to the next generation, generationally? But I also want to tell you that we need to be thinking relationally, relationally. This is about learning how to meet with somebody and, and to share, no, I'm not talking about leading them to Christ. I'm talking about sharing your faith, what God is doing in your life with that person. I talk to people about it and a lot of people older go, well, nobody ever did that for me. I don't know how to do it. Well, then we have a problem, don't we? Because 
we need to learn how to live connected into the next generation. Okay, I, I got to go back just a minute. The other guy, the other guy who was teaching Sunday school, taught on 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, and right toward the end of class, he goes, we need to live like this. And man, when he did that, bam, that is why God wanted him to teach and to me be in the class because I was in I was in the men's breakfast this morning, and as we concluded, I said, "Guys, I want to give you a preview, you know, a highlight of the sermon." <laughs> and you know, Jay's like, "You're weird." <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Debbie tells me that all the time. <laughs> Are you getting it? Because this is reaching up to somebody ahead of you in the faith that you're learning from and you're getting some fire for them. Ted Fogwell, Janine Fogwell, Mike Garst would be some of those for me. And then you're reaching back and you're connected with some people in the next generation that you're taking with you. Hans, Gary, Chris, William, Ken, I can, uh, you know, Drew. I don't, I don't, I don't even like connected to the other guy. I don't know. I, I hope he's still alive somewhere in the world. But hey, the other guy, yeah. But I'm talking about living connected. And 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 so living connected, take what you've learned from me and trust it to reliable men who will in turn train others. One of those guys I mentioned. Uh, he, he was, they were having some marriage problems, so I told him, I said, you and your wife have to come to church. And I made them go to a church that they didn't even like. But they were wanting marriage counseling, so I'm doing marriage counseling for free, so you got to go to church. So begrudgingly, they start going to church, and I, I, I do a men's retreat every year, and the men's retreat is very significant for this ministry. The men's retreat is very significant for this ministry. And uh, so... A, a, a leading, I thought it was a prompting, it turned into a leading. In, in 2014, I did the first men's retreat and invited the men that I felt God was calling me to do. And one of them was that young man who just had started coming to church. And that young man, uh, on Sunday morning, we were getting ready to close. And I said, hey guys, I need y'all to just t to tell me what God has spoken to your heart or what he's done over these, over these days here this weekend. And that guy raised his hand. And he said, over these days, God has really spoken to my heart that he wants me to be a disciple, not a church member. I tell you, there were other things, but I would tell you that was worth doing the whole retreat for that right there. Okay? This guy's kind of, he's kind of shy and quiet. And two weeks ago, we meet pretty regular for, for, for our meals. And we met two weeks ago. And, and... Over the course of our dinner, our, our lunch, he looked at me and he goes, Yeah, I've been praying with my wife lately and for my children. With, I've been praying with my wife and for my children. Hey, yeah. Okay, because he's quiet and I know that that is a real step out for him. Okay. We got, we got done, and we were getting ready to, to get up after. We've been there probably an hour and 15 minutes getting ready to get up. And as we get ready to get up, he said, Hey, bud, would it be okay if I prayed for you right here? I about fell out of the chair. Like, dude, yeah. And so all of a sudden, he bowed his head, and he prayed for me. And then as Debbie and I have been going through our stuff over these last couple of weeks, he sent me an email. And he said a prayer in that email. He, he just laid it out. Here's what I'm praying. And man, you know, those Holy Spirit moments, it just comes over you. And so, you know, when we live like this, 
It's really awesome, you know, to have the strength and the blessing of those people to lean in, you know, call my mic, call Janine, have those conversations. But it's so awesome to the people to watch God work in their life and what God is doing in their life. And that stirs the fire of our faith as well. I don't know. I had anything to do with like Gary growing in his prayer life and stuff like that. I have no idea. But I got to see it firsthand. I got to experience the blessing of that two different times of him praying for me two things today I want you to think generationally which generation are you in how are you passing the fire of your faith making sure that your faith has some fire in it in the coming weeks we're starting back up children Sunday school youth stuff and, and what an opportunity do we understand how important that is so that they're not part of the nuns. And so, oh, well, that's not me, Pastor. Well, you might ought to think about whether it's you or not. You might ought to pray about that. God might have other ideas. Because it's so important for us to think generationally. And so many times they say that, that, that many times before 16, a child really giving their life to the Lord before 16 is so significant. And then, you know, 18 to 22 are just pivotal years of young people's lives when they're making huge decisions about their, about their, their careers, about their spouses. And we need to find all the ways that we can to be ministering to young people ages 18 to 22. When we went to uh, Newgate the other day to fix breakfast, God connected me with a young man named William. And, and William and I are exchanging texts. And he's 17, but a really, really awesome young man about to be 18. Uh, in, in, in these coming days and I'm hoping that I can get William to the men's retreat uh, that we're having in January I'm telling you I'm living in this I'm not just preaching a word like hey you ought to do this I'm telling you this is my life it's how I live and I believe that we're called to be disciples who make disciples anybody know our mission statement for First GMC Gladewater anybody know what it is partnering with God in transforming people into fully devoted disciples of Jesus for the glory of God. And when we look at that, we need to think generationally and we need to think relationally. Okay? Learning how to engage and then connect and then train and descend. Paul, take what you've learned from me and trust it to reliable men who will train others also. Here's the highlight of the sermon. You know, it's football season. They have highlights. So you saw a sermon. Had highlights today. <laughs> yeah, I'm an idiot, but I'll be dumb for Jesus, okay? And, and, and I, yeah, and, and I will. And I tell you, that, that other guy, <laughs> that lesson, when he did that pose... God etched it on my heart. That's how I want to live my life. And doesn't matter if I'm a pastor, a lawyer, or making advertising. I want to live for Jesus, being a disciple who makes disciples for Him. How about you? Amen. Living generationally, living relationally, with a fire of the faith that we got to pass on. Because one of the saddest verses in the Bible is there arose another generation that didn't know the Lord nor the things that he had done. And I don't want to be any part of that. I want to be doing my very best to be passing. I want to have a faith that has some fire in it. And I want to be doing my very best to be passing the fire of my faith to the next generation. How about let's figure it out together. Amen. Amen. Lord, thank you for your presence today. Lord, you are a moving, active, powerful God, and we are blessed to know you, to love you, to serve you, Father God. We need the leading of your Holy Spirit so that we can partner with you in transforming people into fully devoted disciples of Jesus for your glory, Lord, for your kingdom, Father. Lord, we pray for the prodigals out in the world uh, that are lost, that, that, that are struggling under the burden of sin, and they're experiencing that the seeds of, of the destruction of sin are at work in their lives, and we're crying out for you to save them, to redeem them, to heal them, to restore them, Father God. 
lead us by the promptings and leadings of your Holy Spirit to be your people active in the world today. In Jesus' holy, powerful name, amen. Let's stand, sing our praise to God, let God speak even in this moment, generationally, relationally. Holy Word. this church to preach and she's preaching about the word of God and laying hold of the word of God and I know that God's anointing is going to be on you so all of us stand together and bless you as you get ready to go appreciate your courage and your faith woman it's awesome and uh, they're going to be they're going to be blessed no doubt uh, we have a closing that we want to go to to send us out look around for a moment also think of those that are watching online and know that, that we love you guys. We know you're there. Who are we? We are Christ. And we have come to worship the Lord and to give Him praise. Now we are sent by God to be full of His love and Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, for the way you love us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Be blessed as you go today in Jesus' name. Think generationally, think relationally, and uh, let's live for His glory.